Hello, my name is Brad Bodnerchuk, and welcome to the Half a Dozen Hospitality Podcast, where we discuss everything hospitality, from the food on the plate to the teams that make it happen, and the community that drives this industry forward. On this podcast, we sit down and chat with some of the exciting, inspiring, and innovative minds that make up one of the most dynamic industries that there is today. And today, I have the pleasure of being joined by none other than Jill Azanza. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. I don't think I've ever said this on quote unquote on air but i prompt all of my guests as i just did jill that for some reason i cannot look people in the eyes when i do my intro if i do it i start giggling like a little schoolboy. uh so if you are listening on itunes or podbean or stitcher head over to youtube and you can check out the video and watch me stare at the ground awkwardly while i introduce jill and introduce the show we are sat here this morning in what is the uh, what do you call this space? It's the farm s- store. The farm store on the mm-hmm. K and M farm property. Um, Jill and her family uh, were were kind enough to have me out this morning to chat all things poultry, I guess, poultry, and yeah. all things this industry. Yeah, I'm super intrigued uh, by what you guys do. And I was telling Jill years ago, I was introduced to K and M when I came and bought a turkey off of the front porch. <laughs> uh, things have changed a lot since then. A Business lot. is good, which is great. Yes. Uh, there's been some growth. Yes. Um, but help myself and listeners understand what K&M Farms is, why it exists, and how far back it goes. Okay. So uh, how far back it goes. <laughs> so yeah. I'm born and raised on a farm my whole life. I've been on a farm. Um, for some people, that may seem like normal life, but there's a lot of new farmers today that don't come from farming backgrounds, and they're amazing people as well. So Sometimes it's good to say, do you come from a farming background? Do you not? Because the the journey is very different. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so we've been farming chickens and turkeys for 20 years. We started with 50 birds um, 20 years ago, just selling to friends and family. And people seemed to like what we were doing. So we were encouraged to grow. Another thing that happens in this poultry industry is there is uh, it's regulated, right? Mm-hmm. If you want to grow a certain amount of birds. So... We were lucky enough to be brought into, grandfathered into the the quota system. So that has allowed us to grow, um, quote unquote, within the system and providing the product to the customers that seem to want it. What does that look like, the quota? How does that work? So in BC, if you want to raise meat birds, which is what we do, uh, chicken or turkey, there is a minimum or a maximum you can do. So 2,000 meat birds a year for people on permits. Anything over 2,000, you need to become a part of the quota system. So you either buy quota or you get it through the lotto or uh, they're working right now to to provide some sort of mechanism for people to move forward mm-hmm. from permit holders to quota holders. Okay. That's a lot of birds. It's a lot of birds. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't generally do a lot of digging on my guests because I want the podcast to be truly explorational and really genuine in what I ask. But I did go on and Google your name in particular and I found a video that you posted and it was you kind of, I'm assuming in the, what do you call the area where you keep the chickens? The pasture. Thank you. In the pasture. Um, and you, you mentioned in, in like an absolute insane number of birds. Like it's just crazy how many chickens are in there at one time. It may seem insane to you, but you know, uh, Canadians or actually British Columbians in one month can consume 18 million kilos of chicken breast. Oh my so, gosh. Until the demand (laughs) goes down, we shall all keep producing chicken for these hungry people. But you know, it's amazing that you do. And I would love to find out more about the process and what it looks like because I'm I'm a big, big fan as I think the majority of the population either is now or is becoming in regards to ethical raising of the animals if they do choose to eat meat. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know in that video on YouTube, you did kind of mention or you show basically how the birds are living and how they spend their days. So was that always um, the mindset you and your family had when it came to raising poultry? Was you wanted to provide them the most natural habitat possible? Or did you shift with the demand and the way kind of the industry was voting? No, it was always a huge priority for us to have birds expressing what we call natural behavior. So for a chicken and a turkey, that is peck, scratch, forage, and dust bathe. A lot of people forget the dust bathing and it's really important for them. Even on a on a hot day or a cold day, it doesn't seem to matter. They're not using it for temperature regulation. It's just part of their natural way of living is they like to throw dust up on their backs and get into little holes. 
you'll see in the pasture at the end of the season, it's just filled with holes because they've <laughs> all been dust bathing. Um, another important thing for us is room to turkeys really enjoy to open their wingspan and run. They kind of try to fly and it doesn't really work, but they like to try to run. We have a bit of a hill mm -hmm. at the end here and they always try to run down the hill. Anyways, turkeys are very active. They, our turkeys have a couple acres to themselves and they use it fully. Whereas the chickens do stay pretty close to the shelter. They'll roam a little bit, but they're a little more scared of flight predators. Like mm -hmm. the turkeys are huge, so they're not intimidated by an eagle or an owl or anything mm -hmm. like that. But the chickens are very intimidated. <laughs> so like on average, just so your listeners understand, our birds are allowed to live outside and express natural behavior and that's all beautiful. But um, they also run a lot of risk living outside. There's a really good reason that they raise them inside. Mm -hmm. um, a commercial guy's mortality rate, that's the average amount of birds that die while you're raising them, is about 4%. When we raise them outside, it's on average 15. Oh, wow. So, um, yes, happy birds. A uh, <laughs> little scared. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, temperature fluctuations can really harm them because we obviously don't medicate them or give them background antibiotics on a regular basis. So they die if they get sick. Um, they have shelters out there. But, you know, if they get some of them aren't as smart as the rest of them, <laughs> so they'll get wet in the rain and then they get chilled and they die. Um, predators. Oh, each night an owl takes one. The way I know that an owl has taken one is it's headless. Owls love brain. I always mm. tell all my kids groups so that's why owls are so smart because all they consume <laughs> is brain. Wow. A little bit of the neck but yeah. so you know when you've had an owl attack uh, when an eagle comes down there's just a poof of feathers yeah. so they take the whole thing and they go. Uh, we haven't had a coyote uh, breach for a long time. We have electric wire around the entire farm mm -hmm. but when it happens it's really bad. Coyote or mink are the worst because they just kill for pleasure and so they'll oh, just really? kill everything and maybe take one or two away huh, so interesting coyotes are bad <laughs> you know it's so interesting that coyote just a brief little side story here uh my partner Lindsay is a early morning runner like 5 a.m 5 a.m she'll get up and go for a run which is amazing so we have a seven month old baby she still does it <laughs> good for her um but a few weeks ago she went for a run and she was chased by a coyote and she sees coyotes quite often um on her runs uh, but this one decided that it was going to follow her to the point where she had to run as fast as she ever has. And she really? ran back home. Um, she was on the phone with me yelling, like, what do I do? What do I do? And I just wanted to kind of go there and kick it in the yeah. face. But I don't know if I yeah, can do that. Sure. Um, but there's been 30, there's been 30 sightings on, uh, I forget the website, like the wildlife reserve or whatever it's called website that coyotes like in East Vancouver. So maybe the coyotes that have been trying to hunt birds here have now decided <laughs> they're now hunting early morning runners in downtown Vancouver. Um, but that, that is a reality that you face in your business yeah. is, is being outdoors and having natural predators. And that does obviously affect the business. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, birds in a more commercial controlled environment, looking at what a 4% uh, death rate. And then in what you're doing, it's, it's much higher. Yeah. It's just nice for them because they can control the entire environment. So temperature, mm -hmm. uh, vent, uh, light, even like in some of those barns, they have a certain amount of light off time, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you must, right? Let the chickens rest. Well, we have dawn and dusk, so <laughs> it's like nine hours, eight hours, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, it's just different. I would say some days I look out there and I'm like, Ooh, I bet you those birds wish they were indoors. <laughs> and some days you look at indoor birds and you think, oh, I wish, I bet you they wish they were outside. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, we need to provide chicken for every socioeconomic. And mm. to me, as long as you're eating Canadian, you're already doing yourself and your family a huge service. Okay. Um, just don't eat American because yeah. <laughs> there's unregulated use of steroids and hormones. And in Canadian chicken, those have been gone since 1863. So how do consumers know though? And I'm asking more for myself. So yeah. if I if I was to go <laughs> to a big box store and purchase chicken on a styrofoam plate, which I don't like to do, but every once in a while I'll do. Um, if I do do that, how do I know that what I'm eating is Canadian chicken? Your dad's coming in here, which is cool with someone oh, else. Dear. That's oh. all right. Oh Thank yeah. You know. He has a customer. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Do you that's want a, to yeah. No, no, let's do it. This is good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is, this is live radio. This is great. Hello. Good morning. How <laughs> are you? This is what happens on the farm. Yeah. yeah it's great. This is, how, this, is how we, this is how we, this is the idea. This, <laughs> yeah. is, this is the idea of commerce. This is good. Yeah. Um, so sorry, I was asking, so how does the general public know when they go into a big box store that what they're eating is a Canadian chicken. If it doesn't say on the pack itself. It should say, and it should have oh, a okay. big Canadian flag on it. Oh, okay. If you can't see it, it's probably 
not Canadian. So also with the recent change, we're now allowing more. Um, it wasn't just dairy that right. got you know it's every supply managed commodity. So that's turkey, chicken, mm -hmm. eggs, mm -hmm. and dairy mm -hmm. products. So now we are allowing in quite a bit more American chicken. Mm. So you have to be extra careful nowadays. Interesting. If it seems really too cheap to be true, yeah, <laughs> you, you know what? That's something. That's something I always try to educate my father on and dad. If you're listening, I apologize to out you here, but he's a big fan of like bragging, not brag, boasting about uh, going to Costco and getting tenderloin for a really ridiculous price. I just keep telling him like, you should, uh, you should ask yourself why is it that cheap? And protein itself shouldn't be that cheap, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, especially when you look at what should go into raising animals ethically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I digress. Talking about you yourself being a consumer, I'm assuming you eat poultry, yes? Yes. Yeah. So if you and I were doing a blind tasting of K&M chicken versus American chicken versus what's another big, huge brand here? Um, is it Maple Leaf Prime? Is that one of them? Yeah, sure. Prime, or just or? in general. I mean... Yeah. So just like another... Big, big brand, brand. yeah are, um, you, are you able to discern the difference between the chicken and if so what are you recognizing depending on the cut obviously yeah and mostly in the chicken breasts i can tell um because our birds are very active and they run they actually develop muscle okay so um some people actually don't like this about our chicken is that they say that they're it's a different texture obviously mm -hmm. so sometimes when i cut through a chicken breast you know you can see sort of the layering and it's sort of um I don't know how to say this, but uh, it's not mushy. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. There's yeah. like a texture to it. Yes. You can see. Um, anyways, I, I do find a difference in that way. And I think it's more just their ability to run mm -hmm. and open their wingspan, which develops their muscles. Another thing we do is raise them longer. Mm -hmm. So they're a little bit older. Whatever that does, it does change it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Did, and do you find... Are you, you guys, do you partake in farmer's markets as well? We do. Yeah. So do you find that at the farmer's markets, if you have someone that is a new customer and they come back weeks later, what are they saying to you? What are they, What's the feedback they're giving you? Are they amazed? Are they uh, kind of like, yeah, it was okay. Or is it most people like, that was amazing. That was some of the best chicken I've ever had. Yeah. A lot of people say it tastes good. So, I mean, I've luckily enough been eating this for a long time. <laughs> I, the only thing I do is we sell it at thighs a lot. So I go to Costco and buy thighs and I... I don't necessarily notice a taste difference, but my customers say they notice that. Okay, so you yourself, if you were to go and purchase a Costco chicken thigh versus your thigh, you wouldn't really be able to tell. I mean, I can tell because the size is really different. Right. Because the age in them. Okay. Um, but usually when I cook up thighs, I put them in a sauce. So it's hard, to, <laughs> it's hard to say, but I can really tell in a chicken breast. If you put two chicken breasts just with a little bit of olive oil, mm -hmm. salt and pepper, straight up. You can just tell in the texture and in the way it is in your the mouth. The consistency. Yeah. Have you guys noticed a, a change in consumer habits in regards to how yes. much they're eating and how does that and impact you? And what they're eating. And what they're eating. So yes. you mentioned earlier 18 million. Uh, uh, yeah, pounds of 18. chicken breast. Right. So has that number <laughs> changed? Do you know in the last couple, two to five years? And what does it look like for your business? How is it changing seeing more people go to plant-based diets? being more conscious of what they're buying and what they're eating. Yes. I mean, we sell meat as our livelihood, my father and I. That's two nuclear families that are mm -hmm. depending on this. And I tell people all the time <laughs> to please eat less meat. Yeah. Because uh, some people say meat's expensive. And yes, it is if you're eating it three meals a day, seven days a week. I mean, that's insane, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can try to move towards less meat, that doesn't mean you have to buy it from me or all these farm direct people but if you're at least buying canadian meat and you're eating less of it mm -hmm. the demand won't be there so we don't have to keep <laughs> growing to the demand right? right so um what have i noticed so what we have in stock right now which is taking longer to move is chicken drumsticks and mm. chicken breasts mm. and i would say five or six years ago chicken breasts were gone drumsticks have always been a little bit of a struggle to sell mm -hmm. but um thighs i can't keep in stock Mm -hmm. hearts and livers I cannot keep in stock mm -hmm. because it seems to me there's this new wave of people that would like a challenge so something right. with a bone in it mm -hmm. and then uh, pate has taken a great uptake so oh, okay. I used to make dog food with all that but I used to joke to people that when the world ends this is what you should be eating <laughs> yeah. you can cook it if you want you don't have yeah. to eat it raw but yeah. that is the carcass ground up so you have the calcium of the bones it's the heart and the liver all ground into like a 
it looks like ground turkey. Mm -hmm. And really, this is the highest nutritional punch for, you know, yeah. bang for your buck. But they're not quite there yet, but they'll, <laughs> they'll, get, there. they'll get there. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Again, Lindsay, my partner, whenever we do roast a whole chicken, she is the first one to grab a wing and yeah. like eat the bone. Yes. Well, technically, you should eat the bone and suck the cartilage out. Like if you take a page out of our dear friends of, from Africa, that's what all my black friends do. They really? suck the cartilage right out of the bone. Oh, well, it's I very feel, good for you. I feel like I would offend a lot of people because my <laughs> wing eating is just suspect. I, yeah. I just take like the soft meat. I don't eat any. And my grandmother, uh, rest her soul, she used to clean every bone. Uh, so I should take a page out of your friend's books and my grandmother's book because... Yeah, I unfortunately don't do the animal justice when I leave literally some meat on the bone. That is uh, something that you can tell from people who have lived without meat mm -hmm. and through hard times. Yeah. They don't waste a thing. Yeah, good point. We have been very spoiled that we've never lived through famine or mm. war or border shutdowns. Um, I'd like to say that's all coming, though. So yeah, prepare. <laughs> support your in-house people. Yeah, exactly. And get ready to eat some I like a little doom out. and gloom. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, just, it's, it's reality, really. It's it reality. reality. I mean, there's things happening around the world, right, where we used to get a lot of imports, and that was fine, and there were never hiccups, but now there's hiccups. So, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, you got to look at what you're doing and why you're doing it. And BC is amazing. I mean, you have a rice grower in Abbotsford doing sake. You have grains. You have every grain you can imagine. You have mm -hmm. fish. You have all the meats you can imagine. You have all the berries you can imagine. Mm -hmm. The only thing we're missing is a little citrus. And we could get that in a few greenhouses. There's someone in, I forget where, I'm going to find out for you and I'll email it to you. But there's someone right now, I want to say in Ladner. I forget the name of the farm, but they're uh, testing out yuzu. Oh, cool! Growing yuzu. They're doing a kiwi farmer in Abbotsford. Yeah, like there's... I've seen I've seen kiwi at the farmers yeah, market. He's I've, an amazing guy. I saw cantaloupe uh, years uh -huh. ago in the interior, and I was like, okay. "How how are we doing cantaloupe?" But it works. Greenhouse. Yeah. No, it, it was it was, it was literally outside, outside wild, <gasps> just growing organically. Cool. It was on a golf course, which is pretty. Oh, neat. I, I, I you know what's really interesting about this, and uh, we'll get into the dinner series here in just a minute. But the <laughs> uh, the anything about interesting about the dinner series is I've been f not forced, but I've been. Uh, much more interested in sitting down with people like yourself and other farmers and better understanding what we can actually do with our terroir here. It's amazing. The abundance we have here. I'm from Nova Scotia originally Dude, and Nova Scotia beautiful. is great and it has a, a ton of uh, great terroir um, creations and possibilities, but obviously it's far more seasonal there because the weather is so dramatic. Mm. Whereas here it's a little bit more predictable and you really can get great things really 12 months of the year. Then you have other people right now doing really cool things with hydroponic farming mm -hmm. as well so and cool. providing fantastic greens and lettuces 12 mm -hmm. months of the year. Mm -hmm. So it's really great. We're, we are spoiled for choice here in BC. Oh, yes. And we also have wonderful things in BC like access to water, almost unlimited, mm -hmm. mild climate, wonderful yeah. soil. We have some of the best soils mm -hmm. in all of Canada, never mind some people would argue all of North America. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Land can be a barrier for some farmers. Um, I like to remind people that well-established farmers that have been farming for generations all lease land. Like, mm -hmm. where are you? We can't afford it either. I mean, do, you know, so don't see it as a barrier, I guess is my thing for encouraging people to get into growing something somewhere. Don't worry if you're leasing it or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, we're in competition with people that can make 150,000 an acre and blueberries or other, you know, clay-based soil things that do well, like potted plants and nurseries. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when the land's awesome, <laughs> other people know it. And so, yeah. you know, you just have to be able to densify a little bit on your farm, which goes back to, um, yes, we would love to have all our meats pasture raised in this beautiful pastoral environment, mm -hmm. but sometimes... Uh, it doesn't make sense when it comes down to how efficient are you on that land and how much can you produce in a way that's still concerning for the environment, of course, um, but that you need to make enough money mm -hmm. that it makes sense, right? How impacted are you on this farm with the health of the soil? Because I know uh, it impacts a lot of different types of farming. Huge. What does that mean to you guys and how are you managing that? How are you keeping your finger on that pulse in regards to the soil's health? It's huge. Pasture management is a huge part of our business. Uh, even though the birds are just on it, scratching it, interacting it with it that way, they also ingest everything that's on that land. So when we move our shelters, when we move our birds around, the same flock is never on the same square of grass throughout its whole life. So mm. they're constantly moved all over the place. It's good for the nitrogen to be spread around too, right, from their mm -hmm. poop. So mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, our biggest fear is a disease called blackhead that can get into the soil. Okay. And if you don't have enough days of zero in the winter oh. to kill everything, uh, that is a risk. So um, we like having zero days mm -hmm. <laughs> in winter. How, how, how have we done so far this season? Winter? We've never had it, but this is a really warm winter. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that this week it shows there's going to drop yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Because I need at least a week of zero, at least. Even for blueberries, for everybody, we need that zero to kill off any disease. It's amazing that people think, I don't know if they think, I don't know if they're ignorant towards it, but I think we forget how difficult this industry is being farming. It doesn't matter what you're farming and how reliable you are on mother nature. And she is, can be very unpredictable. Oh yeah. Um, and I think the biggest thing in, in our industry, when you look at say the finished product in like restaurants or in homes, what we love is predictability. Of course. But what you guys are dealing with to produce your product is so much unpredictability, whether mm -hmm. it's an owl ripping a head off of a chicken or blackhead living mm -hmm. and thriving in the soil. Or just for any meat farmer access to secure slaughter. Yeah. Because we get bumped all the time because we're the small guy or we get pushed off or we don't have preferential choice because oh, wow, we're the that's small thing. guy. Oh yeah, access to slaughter for meat people is a huge issue. Like pretty much any uh, small farmer with either lamb or pork or beef or chickens mm -hmm. um, is struggling right now to find that access to slaughter. Do you think that depends where you're at geographically? Um, is it a little bit more difficult where, where we are right now? Do you know like in Prince George, it's the same issue? Is it is it kind of province-wide or country-wide? It is province-wide in a way. They're doing a lot of work on it right now for on-farm slaughter for people that are in remote areas, okay. which I think is great. Like, If you can prove you can do it and you can have a Canada Food Inspection, C mm -hmm. Inspection Agency come out and check out all your ways you're doing it and make sure it's all good, uh, any time an animal doesn't have to travel too far to get slaughtered, it's mm -hmm. probably a great day. So I think up in the north or in, in some more remote areas, it's great that they're working on that. I, I've heard some successes out there, so that's good. Um, in the Fraser Valley, we have a lot of lovely slaughterhouses, <laughs> <laughs> but they all grow their own stuff too. Oh, okay. So, so you're competing with their... Well, for the last 10 years, all these slaughterhouses have increased their own growth. Mm -hmm. So... I think any day in the slaughterhouse day when they don't have to deal with segregation and mm -hmm. a lot of multiple customers instead of one right. <laughs> is is a good day for them. So I think their businesses are doing well enough to the point where they're saying we don't need to take on this mm -hmm. custom kill. Bit sad for anybody who wants custom kill, but probably a great day for them in their business. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't uh, pretend to think they should just do our stuff out of right. you know benevolence or something, but. Um, it is a huge barrier for any meat farmer, small scale meat farmer in yeah. the Fraser Valley right now. What is the name of the farmer? A uh, very loud, boisterous uh, gentleman from the U.S. I'm forgetting his name. Joel Salatin. Yeah, Joel yeah. Salatin. I remember I've watched a video <laughs> of him processing uh, birds on his property. Can you do that here if you and your dad and your families are consuming the chicken? Is that something yeah. you can do? Yeah. 50 um, years ago, we slaughtered them all here. Yeah? Yeah. What is, what is stopping you, uh, I'm assuming, I know the answer probably economics, but what is stopping you from investing in a space where you can do that on the farm? Is it just the economics of it? No, I would love to do that. Uh, the city is not very keen on that. Oh, yeah. come on. There's city all Ballister. kinds of <laughs> I'm things sure the, at play. <laughs> I'm sure the mayor is listening right now. Yes, Mr. Braun, how are Mr. you? Mr. Braun, <laughs> hello, good morning. Please listen to the family here at K&M Farms and help them out a little bit. Um I guess that's something too that we we forget about this food system that there are so many people at play there are mm -hmm. so many things at play so many different variables I say in my intro this is the most dynamic industry that there is in the world I think so and that's that's not just restaurants and cafes no. and bars that's everything that is involved in getting to that point mm -hmm. um so let's talk about challenges for a bit sure. the politics I'm assuming is a challenge for growth as a business yeah, also, um, I like to hang out with the young agrarians sometimes, but okay. I'm also just retired as a six-year director of BC Young Farmers. So BC Young Farmers are a little more kids from traditional streams like family farms, whereas okay. young agrarians is, for the most part, some very courageous individuals that are new, new farmers, usually urbanites, kind mm -hmm. of getting interested in where their food's coming from and how they can grow it themselves. Um, both streams create totally different farmers. Uh, both streams need totally different supports mm -hmm. too. So it's, it's an interesting influx of new farmers. Um, challenges. So <laughs> uh, 
the stats can recently show growth in new farm operators and within that growth it was all female so that brings with it a whole bag of new challenges to me because i'm a wife a mother and a farmer i farm livestock so you know three of those roles two of them drop off and i have to take care of the animals right mm. so you know husband too bad like you know and <laughs> child too bad but it's i mean that can create a little bit of a um tension yeah stress. or just stress yeah and just in I your think. own mind a sense of failure right because yeah. you're not able to do everything uh great so you know you have to let some slide mm -hmm. so i find with these new challenges is there's a lot of women operators out there so you know there's just those challenges on one side then you have your sort of regulation challenges um slaughter is very difficult right now and i'm not really sure what the answer is to that because there's no security within slaughter so you plan your little production and you're really happy about that mm -hmm. but you have to have a slaughterhouse that's willing to take them at a certain time sometimes they say not this time this time so then you basically have to base your entire production on when the slaughterhouse says they can or can't do it hmm. um i would like to do my own slaughter so that i control that mm -hmm. but at the same time when there's a really good slaughterhouse <laughs> like a stone's throw that way right. that has wonderful um it's like a top of the line like my birds never are over a four degree temperature oh, it's wow. really important when you're dealing with poultry oh, no idea. one degree over four is salmonella bacteria growth right so oh, okay yes backyard slaughter is, is okay for small bits and mm. if and if and of course if you can build something and you can make it work wonderful but you have to be so careful and I need to be confident when I'm selling that product. Yeah. So I prefer it to be at a certified plant until I can reproduce something like that, of course, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to willy nilly it, you yeah. know, and I wouldn't <laughs> want to encourage other people to do that. So it's hard when you know the access to slaughter is difficult, but you know, it's the right slaughter. Mm -hmm. And so steering away from that certified slaughterhouse is a little scary, but, um, maybe through a lot of conversation it could be done but then you do you have these municipal like we live in this a little bit of an urban you know interface so mm. neighbors complain to me sometimes our llama likes to sunbathe with its feet up and i've had neighbors call in the sbca saying that i have a dead llama that i'm unattending <laughs> to you know? that's just like how she suntans but if they just come up to me and ask me we could that's both hilarious. go out there and do I a welfare I check i feel <laughs> like i feel like you should start an instagram account just for you what's your llama's name shadow he's right Sh there he's watching us because he doesn't like new people oh <laughs> hey shadow <laughs> I feel like Shadow should have his own Instagram account and it should just be every so often just a photo of him upside down saying, I'm okay. I'm okay. Hey, neighbors, I'm okay. That's hilarious. How old is I Shadow? I should make a sign. Yeah. Uh, five. Five? He is, uh, we get a lot of donated animals from oh, okay. people that uh, have hey. either stopped farming. Fiber used to be kind of popular, but now it's kind of gone. Oh, okay. There's a lot of llamas out there that need good homes from people that don't want to do the yeah, wool. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. They're great for predators. Um, whenever a flight predator sees something larger moving with the flock, they're, uh -huh. they're more deterred. He will kill a coyote in seconds. Oh, how? With oh, his yeah, feet? feet. He almost yeah. killed my dog once. Really? They don't like anybody in their field. They don't even like us in there. Oh. Like, he'll come right up to me. That's why his name's Shadow, and he just shadows me the whole time I'm He's in like, there. like, what are you doing Yeah, here? get out of my spot. Wow. It's I'm, great. That's so intriguing. I'm so intrigued by <laughs> animals and how they do things. Donkeys are great, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> they eat a lot. Though. Um, I'm interested to know what you feel. This is a completely, like, me geeking out question and totally personal, so I apologize, listeners, but mm -hmm. just deal with me. I was listening to a presentation about... Um, Kind of like what we're born with as animals and as human beings. So certain things we don't have to be taught. We just know that uh, this means this. And not because we've been exposed to it, just because we know viscerally in our bones. So the example they used were, was they were raising uh, field mice in a uh, controlled environment indoors. And these field mice had never seen outdoors. They had never seen predators. They had never seen anything but what they were shown. And what they were shown on the top of their enclosure was a screen. And that screen, they would send out shapes like a quote unquote flying across it. They would send circles and rectangles and even triangles to see if they could evoke any kind of emotion or reaction from these field mice and nothing, nothing happened. But then as soon as they showed a video of an eagle flying over the field mice all scattered and hid. Mm. Now they had never seen an eagle before. They had never experienced what that was, but it was 
bred in them to react that way. Do you see anything in the chickens or in the turkeys that you're just like, wow, how do they even know to react that way? Or they haven't surprised you and it's just kind of, they just do chickeny things and turkey things. So some people get a bit freaked out about the word GMO, but we have been modifying our genes of our poultry. Anyways, mm-hmm. I'll only speak to poultry for years mm-hmm. to grow to what the people want, right. um, which kind of sounds strange, but uh, we have modified the gene a little bit for the chickens so that they're avent- originally, so they had a little more heavier breast because the mm-hmm. demand for chicken breast was high. Anyways, doesn't matter what you do to these chickens. The first thing they do, we brood them for two weeks. So in a little nice cozy place until mm-hmm. they can regulate their own body temperatures and then they go outside. As soon as they get outside, they eat dirt and gravel. <laughs> as soon as they do, because their crops need it in their stomachs oh, to okay. actually digest things. So when birds are raised in barns, they feed them this oh, stuff okay. so that they can actually make their stomachs work. Oh, interesting. So they need it and they know they need it. It doesn't matter how modified we make them. They right. know they need it. The first thing they'll do is get a bit of gravel and dirt in their stomachs right away. It's like a baby to a breast kind of yeah, thing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. And even birds in barns will dust bathe in the sawdust. You can see holes in the oh, sawdust. Okay. So even even without given the opportunity to dust bathe in, in, in a natural form, if you want to say that, mm-hmm. um, they do it. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the process of what it looks like from mm. when you receive the birds, first off where they're coming from and yeah. then the lifespan and what that bird is experiencing. Yeah. So there's three or four hat trees we can choose from. It just depends who has stuff ready and if they're willing to sell to us, of course, cause mm-hmm. we are buying small numbers again, so we can be annoying <laughs> <laughs> to some people. Um, I don't mind being annoying just so you know that. Yeah. No, yeah. being annoying is great. <laughs> Like, I don't mind annoying the city or, you know, other people. We need that. We need people making noise. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we get the chicks. They come as day-old poults. So the day after they hatch out of the egg, mm-hmm. we pick them up. We pick them up ourselves. That's something to say because most bigger farms get them delivered on a truck. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you say they pick, ride with me. Okay, so yeah, when you, pick them, when you pick them up, what does that look like? Are they all, like, wrapped 12 in blankets? 12 cases. Okay. No, they're in these boxes, big okay. square boxes, 12 boxes. Okay. And they survive on their sh- out of of their shell like so they hatch and they eat their shell for the first 24 hours they they're fine they don't need food or water they just survive on that which is another normal natural thing um so then i come back here i put them in the brooders brooders are small areas that are kept really warm Mm -hmm. um sort of to mimic their mothers sitting on them basically okay um and then after two weeks they we open up the doors and they have a bit of a transition area so they can get used to the natural sun up sundown the temperature fluctuations um you know used to huddling up at when it's cold at night Mm -hmm. and then on the third week we take them out to the back of the pasture we have seven acres here they start at the back every four to five days depending what's happening with the weather we move them around zigging zagging all over Mm -hmm. um when they come down to the bottom it's time to go so (laughs) (laughs) and how long is that process sorry so that can be anywhere from eight to ten weeks it depends on temperature it depends on how they're doing again so many different variables yeah so your average commercial bird is five to six weeks okay um these guys are eight to ten weeks man that's that's a short life it seems short yeah but um these birds are meant they're meat birds so they're meant to put on weight so that's what they do right even if we have it really slow because they don't you know whatever they're dealing with a lot outside so they Mm -hmm. don't just grow whereas inside everything's controlled for them so they can just concentrate on growing Mm -hmm. some might argue that the inside is a bit stress-free the outside is higher stress for sure for the birds like it is yeah i mean it's it's a happy medium like i know why they raise them inside when you look at them some days and you're like yeah but i also know why i raise them outside when i look at them some days so yeah it's it's like I I don't like fanatic people. I don't like, I only eat it yeah. this way. I only want it this way. It's like, you know, there's yeah. pros and cons to everything. And wherever your disposable income lies is where you're going to yeah. make your choices. So yeah, true. I'm just glad there's options on the shelf because, you know. Yeah. My, my hope though is, is that somehow, some way we're able to facilitate a system where protein like what you're providing here is more accessible to everyone and mm. anyone that's my vision and i know there's, we have a lot of work to do to get there um but man what a beautiful world it would be if the families and children and everyone that can't generally afford to eat as well as mm. i'm assuming you and i do if that was just like the norm that would be very very cool mm-hmm. uh, not just here locally but globally as well 
I barter for the rest of my meat. I trade chicken for pork Smart. and I trade chicken for beef. Yeah. Why not? I have to right? trade a ton of chicken for beef. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. Why is that? They feel it's. Well, beef's just more a higher valued product. It's a bigger animal. It's, oh, it's huge. way harder to raise in, yeah. in terms of a whole bunch of other dynamics. Um, let's talk quickly about pride, a sense of pride in what you do, because what you do is very different. You could theoretically be doing a lot of things mm -hmm. with your talent and what you know. You could be sitting behind a desk. <laughs> you could be just ignoring uh, what you're doing and just be a mom or just be a wife, yeah. uh, which you are. Uh, but let's talk about pride when it comes to, again, interacting with your consumers, your customers at, say, a farmer's market or going to a restaurant that they flag your name on the mm -hmm. menu or on their chalkboard and they say, we are proudly serving K&M Farms. How does it make you feel? What, what feelings viscerally are you experiencing? What emotions are you experiencing when you see people either voting to buy your product or celebrating your product on a menu or on a plate? Uh, maybe a sense of relief a little bit. <laughs> um, there's some bad days farming. And when a customer says to you, I enjoyed your meat or I enjoyed what you do, it just solidifies why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. So it takes all those bad days away. I didn't always want to farm. I was raised on a farm, which is usually farm kids don't want to stay on the farm <laughs> because... When you're a kid on the farm, we lived out outskirts, you know, there was no buses. Like I felt very trapped out here as a young teen that wanted to be really <laughs> cool <laughs> with all the cool kids that lived in suburbia and mm -hmm. could walk to each other's houses and things like that. Um, so I left, I lived in Europe for seven years and just avoided, you know, responsibility and stuff where did you, where did you live? a long time. Mostly in France. I, I was a field pair, like a nanny in France. Oh, okay. And then I worked in uh, Irish bars because they always want English-speaking people. Right. And I also lifeguarded for a while in a hotel. But just <laughs> okay. traveled around and mm -hmm. did a whole bunch of things. And then when I, I'd come home every Christmas and we'd slaughter Christmas turkeys old school, like ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I'd take off the French scarf and get down dirty <laughs> and just get all gross. And, mm -hmm. and I loved it. I loved it when people came here and they said, oh, we love your turkey. We've never had a turkey like this. And thank you for raising this turkey. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. <laughs> so I came back and I did some studies in poultry at University of Fraser Valley. And I started getting involved with young farmers. And um, I started lobbying for saving farmland mm -hmm. against developers. And just the more things I did that played into farming and then to actually be a farmer was, um, it just seemed like a logical step after. But I couldn't just sit here and farm and not be involved. Mm -hmm. Like I have a goal of making sure people can access farming, i.e. get into farming if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a goal of how to grow farmers. Like I'm mentoring a farmer right now who is a permit holder who would like to grow into quota holder sort of, you know, future. So I love that. And I think there's enough people eating chicken that I don't feel threatened by, you know, <laughs> or there's a competitive yeah. whatever out there. Uh, a lot of people eat chicken and the more people that can grow it in a way that the consumer seems to want it, well then all the better for the industry. So mm. um, every sector wants to grow in Abbotsford, you know, commercial, industrial, residential and all that. And luckily our Mr. Braun has made a commitment for residential to densify. Mm -hmm. If we could just get him to do it on the <laughs> industrial, I'd be very happy. But um, it's hard because the, Farming has set aside land for the future, mm -hmm. but it's the only land left now. So a lot of people like to dwindle away at that so that they can expand their own sectors. But anyway, so I think all these other things that I do uh, make the farming uh, more attractive in a way or more... Um, like this is my peaceful spot. Mm -hmm. And then when I go out there and I fight all these other people, that's it's the non-peaceful. Yeah, yeah, that's the work, right. honestly. Yeah. Every a day that I could just sit here and farm and not have to worry about how other poultry farmers are moving their business forward or how we're going to have land there in the future to mm -hmm. access, I would probably sleep better. <laughs> <laughs> like I just, some people are like, stop caring so much. Just like go about your own day. But I can't, it's, no. Nah. I can't do that. <laughs> I, I'm, sure, I'm sure the community appreciates that. Yeah. I'm sure your consumers <laughs> do as well. Uh, so in August, we'll be uh, featuring K&M Farms at our half a dozen dinner series at YVR Prep in Burnaby. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of people 
dining that evening of the 60 that have tried your product before, nice. but there'll be a lot of people maybe that will be reintroduced to it or just cool. introduced to it. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever, have you been to either restaurants in downtown Vancouver or even restaurants in Abbotsford that maybe you didn't, weren't even aware were using your product and you were super impressed with what they did with it? Like, have you, have you been wowed by someone's preparation of a chicken thigh that you created or of a chicken breast? Have you been anywhere that's kind of that we can flag that has been really kind of paying homage to what the product is and, and how tasty it is? Um, there's a bit of a problem with um, su or supplying chefs, restaurants, stores. Um, I can't guarantee product because mm. if I do have a coyote breach or something, it's right. all gone. Right. So people can't base their menus on that, <clears throat> which is fine. Also, I can't provide weekly fresh poultry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Already slaughter is very difficult. It's very limited. So... The slaughterhouses have asked us to change our entire production to doing less batches, larger batches, instead of doing multiple little batches. So I don't have the fresh product available for chefs. This, this is a huge conundrum for how we get chefs and local restaurants supporting local farmers when the size of that local farm is not really plausible to be doing that. Mm -hmm. Like... Um, and any chef out there like that's that's actually trying to go get these local things should be freaking awarded. Like mm -hmm. they should have a big badge on the front of their door or something because mm -hmm. it's not easy. Because you can just call Cisco and get everything to your door in, in one truck, yeah. one hit, and they got yeah. everything. Yeah. And probably pretty cheap, you know. So, I mean, you're competing with that and I and the stress of having to collect from all these different farmers or like I, I'll call a chef and be like, sorry, like, the birds just didn't grow like they should have, you know, it rained too much or the temperatures were fluctuating too much or we had a real problem with turkey vultures last year and they, all these trees were just littered with turkey vultures. I'd shoot them, they'd fall out of the tree and they just keep circling. Like they don't, vultures don't care. What, They'll what, eat each other. What were you shooting them with? Well, you're only allowed to use a shotgun because I'm so close to rural people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be careful. I gang unit show up here one day. I I, I kind of want to just bring a film crew out here and just follow you around for a day. I feel like you are like a badass. Uh, Stressful, man. You see these turkey, poor birds. Turkey vultures. <laughs> turkey vultures. Red headed, big beaks. Where are they right now? In California. Oh, okay. And they fly up. They're coming, the, they're coming back. I've had all kinds of wildlife experts because usually when I shoot a crow, I hang up six crows a year on all my shelters. Uh, okay. And they are deterred by their dead cohort right. yeah but uh turkey vultures are not they'll just eat their cohort they don't care is it because turkey vultures are dumb they no they're desperate they're desperate yeah so desperation yeah yeah and wow. that's what the wild guys said too is that they're they've lost a food source somewhere and they're just acting very strangely <laughs> so i just i can't i just i want to see that someday they're huge not that birds. i want to see a bird dying but i i, I sorry i do you find know, it quite humorous these things are rats in the sky yeah sorry. that you shoot it they fall down and they just keep hunting they keep circling wow. they don't even care wow. so you know there's i can't guarantee product i can't guarantee fresh product weekly mm -hmm. and i can't guarantee consistency mm -hmm. so that's the other problem if you're selling a chicken breast on a plate yeah. You kind of need it to be within the same realm, at least a little bit. I'll have chicken breasts that are a pound to a pound and a half to half pound. Mm -hmm. So it's do difficult. You, do you feel though, do you feel that that's changing a bit in regards to the dialogue that we are having in this industry and with the general population of better, better having conversations like this on a podcast where right now we're reaching, I think 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. So educating them on guess what? There, are gonna, there will be some inconsistencies if this is what you're wanting. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of restaurants, head chefs, restaurateurs, they're having those conversations now and they're helping to facilitate that education. Do you feel like that's happening personally? Or do you feel like we still have a long ways to go? I feel like the conversations are happening. Mm -hmm. Whether or not to get our product on their menus is probably a little bit of a longer growing journey. Um, I think features mm -hmm. is the one way to go. Yeah. So we raise birds se seasonally. If someone has fresh pasture-raised chicken on a menu in November, de December, January, <laughs> February, or March, I mean, you have to ask, yeah. how is it fresh? Where did it come from? I mm -hmm. mean, there's no way they could be out on pasture in those months. They'd be dead. So A lot of, a lot of produce farmers uh, that I know and that I've come to know, they'll, it's not uncommon for them when they have a big yield or something to literally, I know logistically it's would be challenging, but literally they show up to the back of the restaurant, knock on the door and say, I've got 10 cases of this. Mm -hmm. Do you want it? And then it hits the fresh sheet because the mm -hmm. chef, he or she is just like super excited about it. Is there a possibility for that model to be something that you could look at where it's you call up your list of like 10 
head chefs, whether it be in Abbotsford or Burnaby or New West or Vancouver, and you're like, look, guys, this is what I've got. It's fresh. It's amazing. Do you want it? Is that mm-hmm. something you've tried or have looked into? Or um, I currently DL chicken downtown. Yeah, wanted, down, yeah. Yeah, they yeah. wanted some of my burns, but I yeah. can't supply how much they need. That's yeah, the problem. They have, so their lineup is ridiculous. It's insane. And yeah. they did a long table dinner out at Glorious Organics, mm-hmm. and they prepped my chicken there, and I was just like blown away by what they did with it. But that was a small thing. They needed 60 whole birds. You know, mm. that was easy. And then they just cut them up the way they wanted. But he said, I would never do this in my restaurant because the sizes were all different, mm. right? Um, they were bigger because <laughs> yeah. he's buying five or six week old birds. Mm. Mine are eight to 10 weeks old. So they're bigger just generally mm. um, because that's what I want. I kind of go after that larger bird market. But um, so he said he loves it and he loves it. And he knows the quality, but it just won't work in his restaurant, right? Because yeah. they really need... And yes, maybe the conversation is changing. There's another guy downtown that I love, Chef David. Um, he just puts out on the menu what he has. Mm-hmm. And Where, where's this at? Sorry. Um, I never say it right. One Dove? One Dove. One Dove? Anyways, it's O N D O. Oh, he's going to hate me. No, no, no. That's right. We'll put it in the show notes. Don't worry. <laughs> it's Fraser and 29th. Yeah. <laughs> Fraser and um, 29th. I saw, that's my hood. Nice. I'm, I'm a Fraser in 17. Anyways, he basically puts out... Oh, Ubuntu. Ubuntu. He used to be a farmer's apprentice. Yes, Yes, they you. do. They do the rotisserie yes. chicken. Yes. Okay, So sorry. those are my chickens. Yeah, I know. I, I, he has you guys Does written he? on the board. Good. Yeah, okay. Kingdom Farm. So nice. that's, why I was, and that's why I kind of... What sparked the question? Oh, me sorry, because, Chef David. No, that's, he's all right. David's pretty chill. <laughs> he is. Uh, David, you don't know me, but yeah. I, know, I know you're pretty chill. Um, <laughs> no, uh, because a few weeks ago, I sat down with my good friend, Dan Larson, mm. who owns Culture Craft Kombucha. Yes. Shout out, Dan Larson. Mm-hmm. Um, and we sat down and we had the rotisserie chicken no at way. Ubuntu. Good and, Ubuntu. And I looked up to see on the wall. And very similar to Farmer's Apprentice, they have their, farm, their farming partners on good. the wall. And you guys are there. And I was like, oh, cool, k and And I thought about this. Nice. That kind of six degrees of separation. So sorry, you were saying, David. So even he, though, like, we have two types of bird. We have a smaller and a larger that we raise longer and smaller. And he would prefer the smaller, not the larger. So there's, anyways, and my fear is um, we used to own a restaurant. My parents used to own a restaurant in oh, okay. Abbotsford, the old Abbotsford cave that used to be across from the mall. It's okay. now gone. Anyways, we, we, I understand restaurants. Like, I do not think uh, these have, guys need to shape themselves around the farm or something. You have empathy. You, know? you have empathy. I have a huge them. amount of empathy. Like, it, it, I just running a restaurant is very difficult, and um, restaurants come and go. Mm-hmm. So, I would never suggest that a farmer have their entire flock or their entire produce going to one chef, mm-hmm. who's stated they'll be loyal, but then you know. <laughs> Just stuff aban- happens just you shit. know yeah, yeah. And it's not their fault the yeah. businesses sometimes farmers i just last like entrepreneurship is difficult oh my god it's like brutal. let's not pretend that we're in this for a social service or mm. something like we all need to make money or mm-hmm. you're not gonna want to do it anymore or there won't be a business so you know yes it's lovely to like grow food and have people come and have this beautiful organic experience mm-hmm. but they have to pay money and you have to make money, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, we do a ton of tours here. We have open houses and I love to educate people. But the only way I'm allowed to do that is because I have a business that is making money. Right. If it wasn't, I wouldn't be in a position to even provide that opportunity mm-hmm. for people to come learn. So mm-hmm. um, get it, farming, it can be difficult, but it is a business and it should be yeah. looked at that way. Yeah, I think I'd, my economics teacher in grade 12, Mr. Plato, mm. thank you so much. You shared an amazing sentence with me that stuck with me to this day. So 37 years later, he said, it's not supposed to be easy. Someone in class said, this isn't easy. I think they're talking about a test or an assignment or something. And he kind of slammed his hand on the desk. He was quite upset. And he said, who told you that this is going to be easy? You are about to leave high school this little incubator Mm -hmm. and go into the real world. Like nothing about this is supposed to be easy, whether it is struggles identifying with different aspects of your life that maybe you're not showing up the way you want to, whether it's business issues, whether it's whatever it is, this isn't easy, but it's about, for me, it's about putting your head down, working really hard and then enjoying the fruits of your labor, if you will. And yeah, you have to treat farming as kind of whimsical as it looks like in the storybooks. It is still a business and it is still a job and, you're going to cut yourself and burn yourself and you're going to yeah. have dead I've animals. I've cut off two fingertips farming. How did you do that? Uh, one, a vacuum packer attacked me. And <laughs> the other time, uh, it okay. was a horse trailer, the trailer hookup. Trailers uh, are very dangerous. Oh, <laughs> God. 
But yeah, so you have the physical side of it. I actually have a personal trainer because I often feel not strong enough to be a farmer. Oh, good for you. Like it happens all the time. I have situations where big grain bags fall on me or different things and I just, it's really scary because yeah. you now, you need a physical strength to be able to do this job. Um, Shout out to all the personal trainers out there. <laughs> if she you, comes if, out with me in the field and we lift huge grain things together cool. and she teaches me how to have more power in my legs and you know just little things that can help me not get injured mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh keep my body going because that's another fear for farmers in the future yeah. is you abuse the heck out of your body and you don't take time to take care of yourself because farmers just like 24 7 seven days a week yeah. and so you know some people are like you have time for a personal trainer and i was like well i don't but yeah but she comes time. with me out yeah. there <laughs> that's cool so what a niche market smart person yeah. smart entrepreneur yes um yeah. uh the gentleman i was telling you before we got on the mics that i purchase our beef mm. now from our, and our pork from uh is up in williams lake um it's called horsefly bc and the farm is called big bear ranch mm. and i think he is ryan i think you're like 74 75 Shut and up. he oh is just God. crushing life like the man doesn't stop and i don't think i've ever seen him not smiling um, I've been to the farm a few times and it's just gorgeous up there and mm. his passion for what he does is amazing. Um, but I also think whether, whether or not you were out there lifting hay bales with your personal trainer, I just think what you're doing, being so physical in your work, and I'm sure there are some desk days as sure, well, sure. but I think that is also going to add some longevity to your life because I'm a big fan of fitness and moving mm -hmm. your body and, uh, it's such a cliche, but move it or lose it is, yeah. is oh, so true. Sure. And the minute you sit there and just are stagnant is when you really start to, I don't want to be too morbid, but that's when you start to die. Mm -hmm. My dad um, runs when he goes out to do all the checks. Yeah. I always thought he was crazy. I'm like, what are you doing? But it's his, that's his little. <laughs> his fitness. Yeah, his fitness. So, and then we carry, I mean, when we collect more, it's dead ones. Yeah. Some of them, if they're towards the end, are really heavy. So you yeah. could have like 40 or 50 pounds in each hand and you're just just farmers Going getting farmers getting ripped out here <laughs> yes. in Abbotsford. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Jill, this show is called uh, the Half a Dozen Hospitality Podcast. So I have for you two questions that I ask every single guest. So I'm going to put you on the spot here, but yes. I have all the confidence in the world you can do it. And I'm here to help you if you need it. <laughs> the first question is the half a dozen have twos. Stay with me here. So I need from you one to six items. So one to half a dozen things that you've experienced in your life related to your work or not, that you feel like our listeners have to do, whether it's a book you've read, a trip you've taken, a meal you've eaten, a song you've listened to, a personal trainer you've hired, mm. one to six items to give myself and listeners a better understanding of who you are as a person. What are one to six things that you feel like our listeners have to do that you've experienced? Hmm. That's a lot to put on the spot. <laughs> um, you can do one or you can do six. Um, I would say always you have to do things that scare you. Okay. Um, things that scare me usually have a better payoff mm -hmm. after. Mm -hmm. um, you have to uh, surround yourself with good people. Uh, you can call it peer mentorship or you can call it whatever you want. But I have a group of people that I call some for productions questions, really great chicken farmers, some people that I call just for business um sense or questions like that and some i have a mom group that i just like cry to for the <laughs> most part but that's important um you know that's another half to you have to get away from your business to get perspective mm -hmm. um i go and tour with a lot of other farmers and i also go tour non-farm businesses because that's really important mm -hmm. uh we get sometimes in our little vortex of farmers and you have to make sure you have a bigger picture mm -hmm. in my opinion um, you have to be you. Uh, uh, we are uh, medium farmers. So like when I hang out with the young agrarians, they're always like, whoa, you're so big. And then when I <laughs> hang out with the big guys, they're like, who are you? Like, what are you? <laughs> what are you where, where do you exist? Yeah. You know? So, you know, it's sometimes difficult not having sort of a, a home for where all your like people are, but, mm -hmm. uh, it's also really healthy in a way. Mm -hmm to be on the outskirts of both of them. Yeah, so, definitely. You know, in a way. I don't know what else you have to do. Those are four really good ones. Yeah. You can stop there if you want. Yeah, okay. Okay. <clears throat> the last one I have for you is the half a dozen haven't yet. So one to six items of things you haven't experienced yet. 
Um, obviously, you're still working with the city to try and make some changes in regards to land. Um, and obviously, I'm, I'm assuming grow your business and see what that looks like five, 10 years from now. But what are some things that you haven't done? You're half a dozen haven't yet. Um, I haven't secured uh, processing for small flock okay. uh, producers. And I hope to do that. I haven't secured a path forward for those small producers to move into quota or whatever, however it looks to grow their business. Um, I haven't figured out what the vision is of this farm because we only own seven acres. And to expand with a land base would be difficult. The property over there uh, just sold for five acres for $2.2 million. Holy. So I can't really pencil that out for seasonal pasture-raised poultry. Right. <laughs> the bank's going to laugh at me. So... Um, on a side note on the banks, yeah. don't be scared to approach them because farmers have the lowest default rate and food is somewhat recession proof. Yeah. People need so to eat. a lot of people <laughs> get scared, but there's, you know, they seem to appreciate us. So <laughs> don't go and have that conversation. Yeah, go and have them. Like, and it's a very sexy story for a bank to be able to, to tell Right when they agriculture can, is good business. Like I think, you know, I think food is good business. Food is good business. Food That's is very point. sexy right now. Yeah. Hey, look in the media. Like what is what is all over Netflix right now? Food. Yeah. Right. What is all over YouTube right now? Food. I haven't been able to sell it to like a meat market, so that is like like a goal. Like I would love for them to just feature seasonal product. How do you mean meat market? Uh, like a butcher shop or oh, okay. like um, Stongs even yeah. downtown yeah. or you know the butcher on West. Or not, I don't know yeah. any of those butcher shops, Jacksons. They they want they want consistency of supply, and I know why, and I'm not denying that. But I'd mm -hmm. love to run some features like pasture raised featured chicken for two weeks in the summer, or this or yeah. that, or whatever. They they're not keen on that. So really, I have to do that. That seems like such a easy one to facilitate. Life is busy for them and it's difficult, right? You know, so I, I don't, you know. I, I challenge that a bit. <laughs> I, I spent five and a half years in retail uh, in the beer industry and I don't want to paint everyone with the same brush, but it's not that they're busy, it's that they're lazy. And, and that could be and easier. It's just, it's just easy. No, it's, this is how I do it. I don't want to change it. Sure, it takes time. And it's going to take effort and bandwidth and manpower and all those things, but... What is the upside? What can you align yourself with and what mm -hmm. positive change can you have? That's that's the, that's what I want to do with this podcast and with my consultancy business is challenge people to say, what can we do to better this industry as a whole? And is it maybe adding a couple hours of work to deviate from what we've been doing for the past 18 months? And uh, I just think at times we can get a little complacent in this industry. Mm -hmm. And it's easy, like you said, to to call Cisco. No offense, Cisco. No. Um, it's easy to call Cisco and to get everything delivered to you. And no offense to the people that no, do that in the industry. I get all. it. Um, but it's like anything else. You get out of it what you put into it. And if you're willing to bend just a little bit more and work with someone, if I can say like a K&M mm. Farms or whoever that is trying to do something a little bit more dynamic, I think the the upswing there is is absolutely... It's immeasurable, and I think it can be truly, truly special for us all in the industry, everyone. Um, but that's just my little diatribe. What do I know? I'm just a guy with a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like another, I haven't made that connection where people in Vancouver would look in a meat market's poultry area and see our label and then understand that they can come see the farm. Yeah. Because that connection is now kind of gone because you have the big, you know, there's Ross down, there's Farm Fed, there's Lilydale, there's Har Hallmark, mm. who all have designated growers for them. So you can't really meet the farmer, talk mm -hmm. to the farmer. We have an open house here. Like we bring everybody on. It's not easy to visit a poultry farm for biosecurity hazards and things mm. like that. But we've been able to facilitate that. And that to go from the meat store to maybe even in a restaurant to coming to the farm to talking to me and having that sort of be more... Um, attainable mm -hmm. i guess is the word yeah uh would be awesome well i i really uh hope that we can through this conversation and through the dinner in august um affect some of the change and get people inspired to come out and knock on the door and yeah. say hello what does the open house look like is it is it certain times of the year certain times yeah of the week? it's in september okay. yeah it's the same every year it's posted on our website it's two days of open house um, my dad does a hay wagon farm tour oh so cool so even if you do come from a poultry farm we pick you up at the gates so there's no concern you get in on a hay wagon your boots aren't touching the ground so mm -hmm. we don't 
worry about that. And then you can um, cuddle with baby chicks. We have crafts. <laughs> I know some people are like, we're going to cuddle these and then eat them. I said, well, you should let them grow a little bit. But yeah, okay. But, you know, <laughs> some kids have never touched a chicken. I don't think, you know what? I hate to say this. I don't think I've ever yeah. touched a chicken. And kids get, some kids get freaked out about their scratching and yeah. their pecking. And it's just nice. It's uh, I always pick up a big turkey for them because they say that the top of their heads feels like nerds. <laughs> okay. And it'll be great. And they <laughs> notice they have no ears. And then we talk about predators. And um, I want people to know that these chickens are suffering outside some days. Yeah. You know, like don't think this is some romantic, <laughs> you yeah. know. They're not, the, they're not the chickens in the books that you read. <laughs> no, you know, and, yeah. and uh, they get attacked by predators. And uh, there's no way I'm going to net off all this acreage so that predators can't survive either. Because that's a part of this whole thing yeah. is that I'm feeding an eagle's family every night and an owl's family mm -hmm. and a couple hawks and... I prefer not to feed the coyotes, but that's okay. Yeah. Do you send these animal invoices? Yes, Just, just I know. post them to Jerks. the tree. <laughs> no, but it's part of it. And um, I wouldn't be raising them outside if I was upset about that or, you know. Well, I, I look forward again to, to facilitating com more conversations about what you're doing here and other farmers as well. And I would love to bring uh, Chef Josh out sure. as well to meet you at some point before the dinner just to better understand. And by that point, obviously, there'll be chicks on the farm, mm -hmm. which is really cool to see. I don't think he's been out here yet. Um, I feel like I should give you an opportunity to say whatever you want, like speak to the public or if you wanted to, whether it's other farmers, whether it's other people that are thinking about leaving their accounting jobs and going and opening their own farm or starting their own farm or like, what do you want to share to the listeners right now? If anything at all. Um, just support they, they, people always ask me, how do I support you? And I say, buy my product if mm -hmm. it works for you. If not, there are some other chicken producers locally that are doing a great job. Mm -hmm. Kendall at Central Park Farms, um, you know, basically almost the same product as me. Um, she's doing a great job. She also goes to farmer's markets and does some restaurants. Um, if you can't come to me, at least just buy Canadian product mm -hmm. because we have a, the safest and nutritious food in all of the world there's a lot of people in the world that are demanding canada product right. and somehow we just don't see the value or we we're spoiled or we don't understand how nice it is to always have safe nutritious product available on that shelf yeah. uh, i've never seen an empty shelf in my life i don't know what that looks like <laughs> so you know we're very lucky to have a consistent very safe food supply um I encourage people to come out to the farm and check it out for yourselves. Uh, we just had some discussion with some local farmers about we ideal world we'd love no labels yeah. because labels are really a, sen a marketing tool. And mm -hmm. if you can't talk to the person who raised it or grew it, it's not, you know, you can't super feel confident in those yeah. labels, sadly. Mm -hmm. So we're like, you know, no labels. Let's just go crazy. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But, you know, um, don't trust the labels. If you have the time to look further, do it. If you don't, buy Canadian and feel safe. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I hope more people can do it like this. Uh, it's not easy. and um, But it's, it's, it's a great new entrant thing for farmers because you can make a little more money mm -hmm. than a market garden, per se, or a one-acre market garden versus a couple acres of meat birds. It's awesome. But the security and slaughter is not there, so we got to work on that. But... Right. So I can't encourage people and then not be able to sleep <laughs> at night because I know they have this barrier coming. But um, it's still a great business. So mm -hmm. if anybody's thinking about it, come talk to me and hopefully I can help you get started and yeah, grow more chicken. Yeah, what a great resource. <laughs> uh, I feel like I feel like you are very much uh, wanting to and uh, passionate to kind of wave the flag of this industry and be a leader, which is so cool. Mm -hmm. I feel so honored that we got the chance to sit down and chat. And something you mentioned a while ago that I just wanted to touch on was struggling with the, with the demands that you feel as a farmer and as a mother and as a partner, a wife, mm -hmm. uh, a daughter as well. Um, I industry just finished, representative. Industry too, representative. Right? I just finished <laughs> reading a book called Relentless by Tim Grover. I talked about it on the podcast oh. before. It's a great book. I would love for you to read it. He, Tim Grover was the, uh, she started off being the physical coach for Michael Jordan, but then ended up being more of a mindset coach for Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, a bunch of the big names in NBA. But one thing he shares in the book is the reality of just that. You cannot, want, you cannot be the world's best entrepreneur and then the world's best father and then the world's best friend. It's just, it's not possible. Mm. You only have so much energy to give 
and you focused on what you're focusing on right now will better serve you in the future. It's challenging right now and it is, it is hard, but I hope that you're able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will, and realize the work you're putting in now and maybe you aren't showing up in certain aspects of your life the way you ideally want to, but just accepting that, that this is your path, this is a journey that you're on and you will facilitate and you will meet that at some point, just right now, this is where you need to be. And uh, I know for a fact, um, you will show up for your family and you will, you will be that person that you wanna be. It's just right now, this is a journey that you're on. So just embrace it, double down on yourself. And uh, I have all the confidence in the world that you will facilitate that sooner than later. So keep nice. it up. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, before I let you go officially, if people do wanna reach out and they wanna engage with you and the farm, how best they do that? Uh, we have a website, which is www.kmfarms.ca, just K and M as the, the letters and then farms.ca. We have a Facebook page, it's KM Farms. We have a Twitter handle, which is KM Pasture Raised Poultry. Um, give me a call, cool. like anytime. Awesome. I'm, I, <laughs> I definitely <laughs> have a lot of hats to wear, but um, I enjoy seeing other people uh, s be able to succeed in farming. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much for making time for myself and this yeah. podcast. I'm super excited to have you guys involved in this dinner series. So just so you know, the dinner series, which we'll talk a lot more about as we lead up to it, is a few months away now. We're talking mm -hmm. about August. But all of the proceeds from that dinner will be going to the Vancouver Farmer's Market Food Program, yes. the coupon program. So the coupon program, for those of you that don't know, the local farmer's market here facilitates a program for people that don't have the ability uh, or live below the poverty line. They can't afford to go and shop at the farmer's market. So these coupons are gifted to these people. So it allows for mm -hmm. them and their families to so come important. and uh, enjoy products like the poultry mm -hmm. from K&M Farms or different vegetables and different things that they generally would not have access to. So I'm mm -hmm. um, so happy that you guys are on board and Josh from YVR Prep and everyone else is going to be involved in this project is going to be amazing and giving back to such a great, great cause. And again, facilitating my goal of putting healthy, nutritious food in people's mouths that maybe can't afford it. So yeah. thank you for being part of that. No problem. Um, thank you guys, as always, for tuning in. As you do week after week, I truly appreciate and love you all. Your support is amazing. You know what to do until next time. Be good and do good. That's it. We did it. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>